It's a year of change, though you could argue every year is like that. Uh, but um, on this show of Profit Insights, we are trying to talk about the big change that is happening, and, and or big change that could happen, that is, that what if central banks, and particularly the Fed, does not enact rate cuts this year. It's something that the Nomura team, um, Sonal Verma and colleagues wrote about a couple of days ago. I thought it was very interesting to have a conversation with her on that. What we've done, of course, is extend the conversation to just not that note and that topic, but also try and talk a little bit about this uptick in global PMIs that we're seeing and what does it mean for growth as well. Both of them are frankly intertwined with each other. Uh, Sonal Verma joins us right now to talk about that and more. Sonal, great having you. Thanks for taking the time out, Neera Jair. Um, and I found it very interesting, Sonal, that uh, as much as it was in 2023, but more so in the current calendar, the beliefs around the rate cut were so strong and so obvious, and now they are starting to unravel a little bit. Uh, uh, how, <laughs> what made you title your note that what if the Fed doesn't cut this year? Because it's still in April. It's not like we are in June or, or August. Yeah, Neeraj, I mean, as you said, things are still developing. Uh, and, uh, you know, just to make it clear, Nomura's base case is the Fed will deliver uh, two rate cuts this year. So we are expecting a 25 basis point in July and another one in December. Uh, but at the margin, I think uh, since the start of this year, we have seen uh, three consecutive uh, upside surprises in uh, US uh, CPI. Uh, and uh, there are rising upside risk to inflation uh, from uh, higher oil prices. Uh, a good part of U.S. disinflation was also core goods uh, related, which uh, could be uh, rolling over. Uh, and therefore, uh, if the Fed does not have uh, confidence around the forward inflation trajectory, uh, there is a risk uh, that uh, the Fed may cut only once uh, or none at all compared to the two cuts we have in our base case. So I think the expectations around uh, Fed policy are still uh, evolving. Markets have come around to what is Nomura's baseline. Uh, but from Asia's perspective, from India's perspective, I think central banks have to prepare for uh, other scenarios uh, compared to the baseline. Okay. And, and, and could can central banks uh, sooner decouple? Because I think in some sense you write about that possibility too. But I would love to know whether central banks and particularly EM or Asian bank Asian central banks decouple and, and some insight into what could India particularly do as well based on the growth inflation dynamics that India enjoys or goes through. Yes, I think it's important uh, we can, uh, you know, look at uh, the need to decouple from the Fed and the ability to decouple from the Fed, uh, both the perspective. A uh, need to decouple from the Fed essentially is a question of uh, do the macro fundamentals in an economy uh, call for lower policy rates? So uh, countries that have lower inflation where growth is soft, uh, where the real rate cushion is uh, quite high, uh, you know, might need to uh, lower policy policy rates from domestic fundamentals po uh, point of view. Uh, but uh, the second aspect, which is the ability to decouple, is really a question of whether uh, central banks have enough uh, tools at their disposal uh, to manage any currency uh, volatility that may arise uh, because of uh, higher interest rate uh, differentials. Uh, and there, not all central banks actually have the ability to decouple, even if they have the need uh, to to decouple. So when we look at uh, Asia, uh, Indonesia actually is uh, one example where there is probably a need to uh, decouple because inflation is low, uh, but the ability to decouple is actually quite less. Uh, you know, BI does have uh, FX stability as one of the uh, major policy priorities. So Indonesia, we don't think can decouple. Uh, similarly, in Philippines, uh, actually there is already high inflation, uh, and therefore their ability to, de to decouple is actually going to be quite less. I, I think India is uh, interesting uh, within this broad framework. I, I, you know, India does stand out as having the ability uh, to decouple from the Fed. Uh, we have uh, ample uh, real rate uh, cushion on a one year forward as well as a two year forward uh, basis. Um, the core inflation momentum, the data we got for March uh, last Friday, uh, showed the super core momentum in India actually running at 0.24% month on month basis. So on an annualized, on a three month annualized basis, uh, the 
super core uh, momentum in India is actually running at 2.9%, uh, uh, which is a big positive. I mean, if you compare this to the US, uh, core CPI in US is actually uh, running at 03 to 0.4% on a month-on-month -month basis. So the core momentum in India is actually much lower uh, than what uh, US uh, has. So, uh, and finally, you know, we have uh, a fairly large uh, cushion in terms of uh, FX reserves. Uh, and therefore, we do think India is one of the countries where the central bank can uh, decouple from the Fed. Uh, the RBI, you know, we think will use uh, the repo rate to manage its growth inflation uh, objectives uh, and use FX reserves uh, to actually manage uh, any external spillovers uh, that can uh, come through. So we do think uh, policy divergence is going to be a major theme uh, in 2024 uh, because of the divergent uh, macro cycles we are seeing uh, globally. Stay on Sonal, so much more to talk about. So, uh, remember viewers, the point around uh, whether the Fed cuts uh, or doesn't cut and therefore whether central banks uh, stay put along, uh, tied at the hip to the Fed or decouple is one big question. Of course, the other question also remains what's happening, um, as we said, to uh, global growth and the different variables. So when we come back, uh, we will try, amongst other things, to talk to Sonal about what is the most important variable, according to her, for the next six or seven months or eight months um, as we look forward to the rest of 2024. Is it the Fed decision? Is it inflation? Or is it global growth and geopolitics? We'll talk about all of that on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back uh, to this edition of Profit Insights. We are in conversation with Sonal Verma of Nomura. There is a a predicted trend by the Reserve Bank of India, and then there is this anomaly of what um, um, geopolitics slash global PMI data could do uh, to commodity prices and thereby to inflation. So the RBI trajectory points out to quarter two being a quarter of much lower inflation relative to the averages of the year. Uh, and the argument was that the real rates differential being so much, uh, that that's probably the sweet spot where the RBI could enact or decouple from the Fed if the Fed doesn't cut by then. With an assumption that the Fed doesn't cut, my primary question to you is, and if the if our inflation, India's inflation that is, uh, comes in at the lower end in quarter two, do you think that's the time zone where the RBI does some rate action? Part two of my question is, can this uptick in PMI data leading to maybe some commodity price inflation thwart that lower inflation trajectory? So, I mean, that's a very good question. I think, you know, our base case right now for RBI is for the first cut to come through in uh, August. Um, you know, for India's uh, policy trajectory, we do think that uh, food and oil prices are a bigger risk uh, than the Fed uh, per se. Now, on food uh, prices, uh, we know that uh, near months is going to be a hot uh, weather climate, which could negatively impact uh, vegetable prices. But we also know that uh, uh, the climate models are predicting a transition from uh, El Nino to La Nina after June. Uh, and therefore, the Kharif uh, crop uh, for 2024 could actually uh, be better uh, than expected. So uh, while there are some certain categories of food um, like uh, edible oil, which are starting to see some upward uh, pressure, maybe, uh, you know, wheat, uh, coffee, uh, but some of the broader food basket could still see softer inflation uh, if we get good monsoons. That's one. Uh, the second risk in terms of oil price, I mean, clearly higher oil prices are negative for India from a macro perspective. Uh, they, you know, lead to wider current account deficits, uh, you know, higher inflation. Uh, we also know, though, that uh, oil marketing companies uh, are, you know, have actually kept oil prices locally unchanged despite the huge volatility in oil prices uh, for the last many, many months, uh, barring the recent reduction we uh, saw in petrol and diesel prices. So uh, despite the fluctuations we are seeing in global oil prices, our view uh, is that oil marketing companies are unlikely to uh, hike uh, petrol and diesel prices, uh, you know, in the, any time in the uh, in the coming months, and we will need to see 
a sustained rise in oil prices uh, for OMCs to actually pass it to local consumers. So uh, while the impact of uh, high oil prices will show up uh, on the current account side as the import bill becomes more expensive, uh, we don't think there'll be any direct uh, spillover uh, in terms of uh, the inflation uh, basket. Uh, so we are comfortable with the base case uh, of uh, August uh, cut uh, from the RBI on the back of that. Uh, on part two uh, of your uh, question, uh, Neeraj, in terms of uh, the risk from commodity. So that is a real risk. I think uh, outside of uh, food, um, if we do see a sustained increase in oil, uh, but also, you know, the broader bucket of commodities, uh, including industrial metals, which are closely linked to global industrial cycle, uh, then that would mean that uh, some of the goods disinflation that India has seen uh, in the last 12 months uh, could run its course, could have run its course, uh, because uh, manufacturers uh, will start to see the cost pressures build up. And, uh, you know, while initially they may take some margin squeeze, uh, it might might start getting feed, you know, it might start feeding through to uh, consumers. So I, I do think that's a risk we need to monitor uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how broad based and how durable uh, the current commodity increase we are seeing. That could be a risk to India's monetary policy outlook as well. Mm -hmm. What's your base case out there, Sonal? I mean, factories across the world seem to be cranking into that gear again, but uh, China, we know, isn't quite growing. Uh, very rapidly. I mean, sure, there are some green shoots around the margin. So, is the base case from whatever you gather right now, is the base case for a, a linear uptick gradually? Could there be sharp volatility? Or do you believe that uh, because China growth isn't quite as strong, that the upticks will be short lived? What is the base case? Very hard to say, uh, you know, how this is going to play out. Uh, I mean, the base case in terms of the uh, activity side uh, is positive. Uh, so we do think that uh, the good cycle will continue to pick up uh, over the, you know, through the course of uh, 2024. Uh, what we do see, though, is it's not really China driven. Even the good, the green shoots in China are actually more China's exports, uh, not China's own domestic uh, demand. Uh, so. Uh, um, where we are seeing green shoots is actually more in uh, US uh, and Europe. Uh, and that uh, resilience uh, in US, of course, continues. And at the margin, the lower inflation uh, in these countries may be a positive for real incomes uh, for consumers. And that may be leading to uh, some goods demand coming back. Uh, part of the goods cycle is also uh, just the end of inventory correction. Uh, we did see massive inventory corrections in the last 12 months, which was a big dampener on demand for the goods uh, cycle. So that is also getting uh, over right now. So uh, those factors should support an improvement in goods demand in 2024. Uh, but it's more US driven than uh, China driven. Uh, and, you know, therefore, to your question of uh, how broad based it's going to be, um, you know, for instance, oil, uh, some of the increase is more geopolitical uh, risk premium driven uh, right now. Uh, we have also seen some increase in uh, industrial uh, metal prices uh, in the last uh, few months. Uh, so things do seem to be stabilizing on the commodity price front. Uh, so uh, it's very hard, you know, given the various moving forces uh, to predict uh, how broad based and how sustained uh, it's going to be. Uh, but it does look like if the goods demand is stabilizing and is set to move up, uh, then that could be, uh, uh, you know, a, a, head, a tailwind for commodity prices uh, this year. Mm. Uh, my, my final question, uh, Sonal, and that is around uh, what Asian economic growth could be like. Uh, uh, this this long-held belief, right, that uh, Europe plus one and China plus one will benefit a bunch of South Asian countries, including India. Uh, some of it has been seen. Some other smaller Asian countries have... Uh, get uh, gotten a head start on this, but it seems to be a present continuous phenomenon as, as opposed to something that happened in the past and has reached a point of saturation. I'm just trying to think what's your thought around this and, and is this something that will last for a bit? Because while we hear a clutch of noises around how companies and global companies want to set up in India, the actual hard evidence in terms of numbers on the manufacturing side at least is not as strong. Maybe on global capability centers, yes. Services, yes. But hardcore manufacturing setups, not quite there. 
Uh, I mean, I, I think we are still in the very early stages uh, on this, and uh, we do think this is going to be a multi-year trend. Um, it is, you know, of course, diversification from China, but it's also about, uh, you know, putting your eggs in different baskets and not just in one basket. So it's also a risk mitigation strategy uh, that MNCs are following uh, globally. Uh, and as, you know, um, as we head towards the U.S. presidential elections, there is also a risk of more trade tensions actually picking up uh, uh, going forward. So we do think that the process of near-shoring, friend-shoring, trade diversification will continue. Now, as you said, uh, it's very hard to uh, gauge uh, this in hard evidence. Um, particularly FDI numbers uh, don't necessarily reflect that. But if you look at uh, exports of specific product categories, uh, you are seeing an improvement. So India's export market share on electronics uh, is going up uh, in terms of, you know, just the global uh, electronics uh, market uh, share. Uh, similarly, we are also seeing an improvement in some other countries in specific uh, product uh, categories. So uh, the evidence in terms of export market share, I think, is visible. Uh, but uh, because companies are still relocating, uh, the full benefit of this is is likely to show up uh, in the next, uh, uh, you know, more like a three to five year uh, time frame. Uh, for now, the growth uptick we are expecting in Asia is either more the improvement in the cyclical goods sector uh, or the resilience in domestic demand that we are seeing uh, in countries like uh, India, uh, not really building in that much of a growth uh, delta from the supply chain diversification uh, because it's more of a medium term story. Okay, sorry. Now, this will be my last question, Sonal. Uh, so, uh, and then we wrap it up. But uh, as you look ahead for the rest of the year, what becomes the more important variable to your mind as things stand? Is it the timing and the pace of the cuts still? Or is it geopolitics because it is uh, now becoming much larger than what it was maybe 18 months ago? Or would it be the green shoots of growth that we are seeing? Ceteris paribus, uh, they move ahead and become even stronger. What is the more important variable from an economic slash growth perspective? I would have loved to put in the earnings growth question there, but uh, not that, but the former two for sure. So um, when we entered 2024, I think uh, the big theme in everyone's mind was soft landing uh, in the U.S. So, you know, growth holds up, uh, inflation comes down, uh, Fed delivers uh, significant uh, rate cuts. Um, we have seen massive repricing of uh, Fed uh, with, uh, you know, moving from six cuts to now uh, under two cuts uh, for 2024. We do think that uh, the most important factor going going forward uh, is going to be inflation uh, dynamics uh, because the assumption is still uh, that uh the last two, three months of inflation upside surprise in the US uh, is bumping the road, uh, and we will see disinflation back half of 2024. That's also Nomura's uh, base case uh, right now. Uh, but we have uh, consistently sort of seen uh, upside surprises on inflation, uh, and with these geopolitical risks uh, on the rise, also the good cycle uh, improving. Um, services inflation has also been a bit more sticky uh, than expected. So expectations around inflation uh, and therefore uh, the spillover uh, onto monetary policy outlooks, not just US, uh, but globally uh, will be more important. And part of the growth optimism that we've seen in 2024 is actually as a result of uh, expectations of lower inflation, its positive impact on consumer demand, on firms' profitability, and on expectations of lower rates actually impacting the interest rate sensitive cyclical. So I think uh, that could also uh, get impacted if there's uh, you know, a shift in the view on where inflation is headed. So I think the most important uh, thing we need to watch uh, this year uh, is uh, the inflation outlook. Great. So, Verma, always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much uh, for speaking to us today and look forward to, of course, have you during the very more important events as they develop during the course of the year. Thank you very much. Uh, the pleasure was ours and viewers. Thanks for tuning in to this uh, edition of Profit Insights.